Maybe we should try to find somebody. Think anybody's home? Door's locked. This is the kind of place that if you show up there and you've never been there before, everybody knows you're there. They know I'm here. They're watching me. I'm on the central British Columbia coast in Heltzik territory. When people think of British Columbia, this is what they think of, with the sea and the mountains and nature. It feels more grounded here, it's more real. It's like, you don't think about your bank account, you don't think about the latest trend in coffee. People have been coming here for over 100 years to basically exploit the natural resources here, primarily for lumber, fishing, and mining. All of those industries have to be built and implanted into the land. And unfortunately, when those industries leave, they don't take their garbage with them. Maybe I'm being a little opinionated about it, but hikers have a rule that's, if you pack it in, you pack it out. And I have no idea why that wasn't a rule for these large industrial companies. But I guess when it comes to big business, rules don't always apply. After European settlers had worked their way west across Canada, eventually they made their way up to this remote stretch of coastline. And what they found was breathtaking. A vast wealth of unspoiled, untapped resources. Once they pushed the indigenous people aside, those taps were opened. It took a lot of work to get the infrastructure built on these rugged lands. But for those profiting from these industries, it was well worth the effort until it wasn't. Once those booms went bust, the corporations shut down, leaving their mess behind. I'm on my way now to one of those abandoned industrial sites, the Namu Fish Cannery. There's Namu now, just, just getting a peek at it. This cannery was built in the 1890s, and by the 1950s, under the control of the BC Packers Company, it became one of the largest canneries in the country. Thousands of people came to work and live here every summer, but the site was closed in the 70s and has been crumbling ever since. I hitched a ride here with Harvey Humchit, a hereditary chief of the Heltzik Nation, along with his daughter Megan and her friend Charity. Harvey has a long history with Namu. As far back as I can remember, my parents used to come to Namu to work there. My mother worked at the cannery, and my dad fished for the, for the company. We'd pack all our belongings and move down to Namu for the summer. It was like uh, going camping. When they shut down, um, a lot of people were left without work. So those were hard times? Those were difficult times, yeah. I wanted to dock and check out the cannery. But before we could, we were greeted by a special welcoming party. Yes! <laughs> the whale is bubble feeding. Makes a ring of bubbles, and then comes up inside of it, and eats all the herring. Wow! It's fitting that we saw these guys here at Namu. If the name rings a bell, it's because one of the first ever orca whales displayed in captivity was named Namu after it was caught here in 1965. 
These are sacred lands for the Heltzik Nation. Recent archaeological digs have discovered evidence of some of the earliest human activity on the BC coast, dating back over 10,000 years. How does it feel for you to come back here now and see what it's like? Yeah, you get mixed feelings. A lot of different things could have been done with it. But when the companies were finished, they sold the place and kind of just left things to fall to, fall to the ground. Harvey has led a campaign for the Heltzik to buy Namu back. But the cleanup process alone would cost more than the land itself. So Namu keeps wasting away. Helsic and a lot of indigenous people, you know, you're connected to places. And so this is a place that, you know, people have continuously occupied for thousands of years, you know, and to have it just abandoned and forgotten, not by Helsic, but by outside people, is a real slap in the face. To have this as part of your economy and then completely gone, and then we still see the remnants of it today. This is something that belongs to us and it just doesn't look like it. Thanks, Harvey. See you in a bit. We are going to stay on the concrete. OK. Because I don't think the wharf is going to be safe. I think this was a store. Yeah. Gas cans, chairs. So yeah, they just left everything the way it was, huh? Yep. Pretty much. I hope this place doesn't have asbestos. It probably does. Kill your television. Oh, those rollerblades work? Probably. Put them on, put one foot in front of the other. Wait, they're two left feet. Oh. You can do it, you can still do it. <laughs> they're two right feet. Okay, oh, wish me luck. Megan. Oh. oh, God. Uh... <laughs> Graceful. So graceful. We're waiting for the fall. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Right. <laughs> it's really fun. I can see why it, these used to be so popular. The store is still full of products. This is a total post-apocalyptic moment. Yeah. Come in here and get survival means. There's books, VHS. Oh, it looks like there's actually some homemade movies. Uh oh. Hmm. Good kind or the bad kind? <laughs> I think it's the, the good kind. They're full, full of motor oil. And just like left here. If this thing, you know, collapses and falls into the ocean, all of this goes in the ocean. Perfect example, look at this. Here's an open bucket of oil just sitting here. You know, this is an environmental concern. And people need to know this and, and people need to pay attention and do something about it. It'll be the health sick people that are affected by it. When was the last time you guys were here? It's been quite a few years. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lot nicer than it is right now. What do you think the future is for Namu? Well, if we're trying to ask for help from the government, it's going to stay the same. And you don't have faith that the government's going to step up and help out? No, it's been a long time. And it would have been something would have been done already if the government was going to help. Right. Do you know if there are environmental problems from the structure falling into the ocean that are affecting the wildlife here? given that the salmon is our way of life. It's one of our natural resources that we're very dependent on. So when you have something like asbestos going into our water and you know salmon potentially ingesting it, and then we ingest the salmon, you have to protect your natural capital in order for all other capital to thrive. The environment gets sick, we get sick. For the first time in over 10,000 years, nobody lives in Namu. And it only took a fraction of that time to make it like this. Hopefully this spot gets cleaned up soon and the Heltzik can reclaim their cherished land. I did a repatriation project here. I brought back uh, over 140 ancestral remains and buried them behind the, the mess hall there. Reburied them. 
The oldest ancestor was from 5,000 years ago. The newest was from 2,500 years ago. Since the cannery was built, it has changed this whole site. We're right in the middle of the Great Bear Rainforest. We got the most contaminated site in BC. Just to let it go and leave it like this. I mean, look at it, oh my. I'm back on a boat and on my way to another relic of industry built on traditional Heltzik land. And out of the way, former company town called Ocean Falls. At its peak, almost 4,000 people lived and worked here at one of the largest pulp and paper mills in North America. There was a school, a hospital, a hotel. The mill closed in 1980 and now there's only about 20 people left. Here we are, Ocean Falls. Home of the rain people. I buy it. These houses are kind of amazing. Think anybody's home? It's raining in here too. Still raining. I haven't found any locals yet. I feel like they know I'm here. They know I'm here. It looks like that house blew up. I'm gonna drop a log. <laughs> There's a splasher. <laughs> Here's a local. Hey, can we talk to you about living in Ocean Falls? Huh? Can I talk to you? Nobody wants to talk to me. What's, what's it like to live here? How long have you lived in Ocean Falls? No? This is the dam? This is the dam you were talking about? Yeah. I'm standing beneath a crumbling dam in a crumbling town, and I'm talking to a dog. I think I need to change my technique. Do you have a person, a human? Huh? Can you take me there? Kino, shush. Is that your dog? It's my wife's. That's Jax. Jax? Yeah. Jax is the only local I've been able to talk to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how long have you been here? Five years now. What brought you here? Owning a lodge. Just being on the internet, kind of looking for something, just that right spot. According to my wife, this isn't the right spot, but it is for me. <laughs> <laughs> it was the town and what it used to be that really intrigued me. I kind of wish I could have seen it back in the day, sure. just because, you know, up behind us, it was five extra streets. Oh, wow. It was all boardwalks. So um, it was like 22 people here? I think so. Yeah. I think we're around 20, 22. Since I've been here, we've had I think two sets of investors come in and look at all this stuff. Oh yeah. But then the problem with the people that live here, the majority of them, they're retired. They don't want to see the place get crazy and start right. booming again because then it's just going to get busy, right? Yeah. And they love the quiet. And, and they're here to escape it. That's right. Yeah. You know, the, the city life and the people and. Yeah. Now that we've found you, our first local, is there anybody else we can talk to that you can think of? Norm. He was the last guy to be locked in the courthouse cells. <laughs> right? Because the, the police caught him up by the Hilker. Well, one of the locals uh, ratted on him, and, uh -oh. and uh, uh, they came in and cut down his grow up. I think he had about 75 plants going or wow. something like that, right? But yeah, Norm's definitely, he's awesome. How you doing? Pretty good. I'm Rick. You're Rick the interviewer. I'm Rick the interviewer. OK. Who are you? Nearly normal Norm. OK. <laughs> that's what people call me. How come? Well, that's what they call me. So how long have you lived here? I came in 87. The town was actually closed, but the mill was still there and everything. Yeah. Do you think you can give us a tour of the town? Yeah, there's not much to see. Perfect. <laughs> Where did you grow up? In Toronto. Then you moved out west? 
Yeah, I sort of got in some trouble back east. Ah. Small things like drinking and driving. But in this town, you can drink and drive all you want. Who's going to stop you? Right. Our first stop is the historical Martin Inn. With over 300 rooms, it was once one of the largest hotels on the West Coast. It wasn't like this when I came here. This was locked up, and it was just like brand new. Oh, really? They had the salt, pepper, and shakers on the tables, napkins. Looks like it was a nice hotel. It was. When did the ceiling collapse? 10 years ago, maybe. Yeah. This could probably go to one day. 86 was the last year the people were in here. Oh, OK. Then we just came and unlocked it and stole everything. <laughs> you know, oh, why not? We took out uh, 300 refrigerators to Bella Bella. Oh, really? I think we got 20 bucks a piece. On that note, Norm had to cut our tour a bit short. We happened to catch him on the one day a month. He takes a ferry out of town to cash his government check and party for the night. Thanks for everything, Norm. I know you're going to enjoy your party night. Yeah, I'll be high anyways. High on what? Pot. Oh, really? You guys, any of you guys smoke? I think somebody might be, might smoke on the crew. Give you some too. Oh, uh, maybe, no, maybe tomorrow. Nice. You go no, I'll hold up. It's okay. Marijuana? I've got that. <laughs> you can have it. Is that all right? Yeah, I got a whole bunch of them. Safe to say, Norman likes to party. I think he lives for it. <laughs> it's cool to see somebody living here and being totally content. He's like, it's great, it's nice. Everybody's happy. You just drink and smoke weed. Before he left, Norm asked me to check out the Ocean Falls Museum, a collection of artifacts he's personally scavenged for the last 30 years. He told me to find Herb, the local harbor master, who let Norm set up his museum in one of his buildings. Come on in. All right. He knows that I don't go up there very often. Oh, uh, OK. I'm not interested in the past. I've already lived that. Oh, wow. So this is Norm's museum with all the things he's collected from the abandoned buildings here? You got to hand it to him, because there's a lot of these things that shouldn't disappear. Right. Wow. Norm was on the cover of High Times in 1996, and the caption is, Better Sex with Norm. Makes sense. <laughs> Ocean Falls Swimming Pool. Where is it? about halfway up to the, the dam on the right-hand side. With, but they destroyed everything. They wanted to do away with everything here, you know. Just shut the whole town down? Yeah. I even had some government boys tell me, said, what are you doing here, Herb? We're going, to, we're going to do away with this town. I said, no, I don't think so. So do you think you saved Ocean Falls? Well, I sure saved that end of it. And I saved this building. And I, uh, I built a few things around here to Make it work. And Herb was determined to make it work. He wanted to show me the harbor he rebuilt to attract tourists and help keep Ocean Falls alive. Shotgun. How many roads do you have here? Just this one. Just the one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that outhouse right there is the first thing that I built here. Oh, is it? Yeah. That's a good idea. Because I was told. Until I got here, there was no need for any toilets. <laughs> so this was basically in disrepair when you got here? There was a lot of stuff that was falling apart. Yeah, I had put this section in new. I have the water supply checked constantly. I promised the government I wouldn't kill a tourist. <laughs> you haven't killed anyone? No. Okay. It seems like Herb single-handedly turned this place around. I think if there's no Herb, there'd be no Ocean Falls. It would just be probably people growing weed. No herb, all herb. This place might look like a decaying mess to some, but to others like Herb and Norm, who are still hanging on, Ocean Falls is an oasis, a community that offers them the freedom to live exactly the way they want in their own little piece of paradise. After taking a boat to see Namu and Ocean Falls, I'm now in the sky, 
heading even deeper into the remote north, near the Alaskan border, to check out another mess that industry left behind. The indigenous people called this place Antioch, which means hidden water. Just landed at Antioch. Black sand. Welcome to the moon. Or Pluto. Welcome to Uranus. Time has been pretty rough on Antioch. But back in the 1920s, it was home to one of the largest producing copper mines in the British Empire. Its population peaked at 3,000 before the price of copper bottomed out during the Great Depression and the mine shut down in 1935. Now, the population sits at just two. Frank and Wanda Lewis are one of a few couples that take turns living and working here, salvaging the black sand that is a byproduct of copper smelting. So this was a town of 3,000? About that, yeah. And now it's a population of two? Yes, correct. <laughs> <laughs> Would you prefer two people or 3,000? Two. <laughs> How did you guys meet? She was a bartender. I was a patron. patron. <laughs> we'll call it That's a what we'll call you. <laughs> I worked there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. What am I looking at, Frank? It's a slag that comes out of the smelter when they're smelting it. It's used for like grinding wheels and asphalt shingles. And... So this has been piling up here? Yeah. I've been digging out of this pile now for 25 years. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and your job is to uh, put it on conveyor belts and? Put it on the conveyor belts and load barges, yeah. Yeah. And then one day it'll all be gone? Yeah. It's kind of beautiful. Yeah, even for just a bunch of black sand, it's like, it's still really interesting, so. Yeah. So I've been digging a hole down in that bank down there so I can see the ocean when I'm working. Oh, right here? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like a theme park. We're just going on a ride, checking out abandoned copper mine, Bill. That's the power plant? That's the power plant. Do you want to go down in there? Yeah, sure. This is an amazing place. There's this giant crane in the ceiling. It was probably built 100 years ago. It still works like my scrawny little arms could like move this thing. It works better than my garage door. <laughs> this place is almost salvageable. I don't know. It's got like a sturdy metal frame and some solid bricks standing still. It's super insane that this is here. It is so far removed from anywhere and remote. This is no small feat to come all the way out here and build this infrastructure. And I can't imagine what it would have been like here 100 years ago. This would have been a lot of tough dudes dying young. I make a great craft brewery in here though. Dam. When they decommissioned the dam, they blew a big hole in it so the water would just flow through. Wow. All right. It's kind of sketchy. You ever walked across that, Frank? No, nope. don't like heights. I think I want to walk across it. You think it's safe, Frank? It's safe for you, <laughs> not for me. <laughs> <laughs> Run real fast and I won't have time to break. OK. <laughs> oh, I just got really scared. It's really high. The rain isn't helping. Frank told me that this dam is over 100 years old and was once the tallest in all of Canada. 
It's crazy to think that the tallest of anything would be built in such a hard to get to spot. That was really scary for me. And whenever I was holding onto the railing, I felt like I was kind of leaning into it, <laughs> which was, there's a death drop on either side. I don't know if I'd be able to cut it living and working in such a remote place, but it works for Frank and Wanda. And there is a plus side to being the only two people here. You never have to wait for a tea time. I found a nine iron. <laughs> <laughs> There's a par three hole right there. Oh, that opening. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you're going to have a tough time digging that one yeah, out. Yeah, that's, that's kind of rough. I'd say uh, nice and easy. Oh! It seems like everywhere we hit is in a sand trap. Wanda. Nice! You're in the fairway. Yeah. You got the cleanest lie. Hey. He <laughs> <laughs> oh, did it, man. Tim. <laughs> I got a birdie. <laughs> the hell was that? <laughs> Who knew? Do you copy? Yes, copy. Two more balls. <laughs> Two more balls. Louis says if we want to get out today, we need to go now. You heard that? Yeah, we got to go. I want to finish my game of golf, but I guess we have to leave because the weather's about to change and we're taking a plane out of here to Haida Gwaii. It's too bad I was playing well. Upwards and onwards. All right, you guys. Thanks so much for everything. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Have a good trip. Frank, appreciate it. Take care, guys. Antioch's was unusual, to say the least. Seeing all the sci-fi looking black slag left behind in such a pristine area, it's nice to know that at least some of it is being cleaned up and put to good use. I'm about 200 kilometers south of Antioch, on Haida Gwaii, a sparsely populated group of islands. There's around 5,000 people that live here now, about half of which are First Nations. The Haida people thrived here for over 8,000 years. This area provided everything they needed. They had the ocean nearby, abundant wildlife, and plentiful trees but it was those same trees that brought European settlers here in the early 20th century. To them, it was a gold mine. After contact, when people started coming to Haida Gwaii, they realized that the trees here were some of the best in the world, strong and straight and tall. So they logged it all, they took it all down. And now this is the second wave of trees here that's been replanted and those are getting cut down. Here comes the third wave. It's really easy now to be critical of what people did here with the logging. Back then, no one had any idea about preserving anything like that, you know, like preserving a forest for any reason. To them, it was just a useful resource. There's not a lot of jobs on Haida Gwaii, so a lot of people are loggers here. It sort of seems like the, the lesser of two evils, maybe. Work in the logging industry at home or leave home. And this is a pretty special place. It would be hard to leave Haida Gwaii and go somewhere else. After seeing some ghost towns left behind by industry, I'm stoked to head to Kusta, an ancient village site abandoned by the Haida people almost 200 years ago. Showing me around are locals Raven Pochka and Alana Jacobson. See this right here? Yeah. So this is part of a longhouse right here. Oh, really? So we're starting like right in the beginning of the village. And so when you see these beams, just step over them. Yep. We're trying to just... Don't stomp them. Yeah. Um, and we'll just show you a bunch of different features all the way through. How many people do you think lived here? 
Mm, probably like 800. And this is our first pit. What was the pit used for? So these were the houses. Inside a traditional longhouse, there would be kind of tiered levels, and then in the center would be the fire. And those who slept closest to the fire were those of the highest esteem. Right. And these houses were quite close together to prevent people kind of sneaking up from behind. Right. And you see all these stinging nettles? Those were intentional. Oh, really? Yeah, so if you tried to, you know, kind of sneak through the bushes, you just get really, Stung up. yeah, all irritated and stuff. Oh. So. Stinging nettle security system. Yes. <laughs> if you don't know about stinging nettle, you'll, you'll find out yeah. pretty quick. Do you guys have any aches and pains? Arthritis? Uh, I'm a skateboarder, yeah. Everywhere. Whack you with some stinging nettle. I love it. Awesome. <laughs> what did the population look like here before contact and after contact? And how did this place get abandoned? When we were in contact with the sicknesses, the population was 14,000 to 20,000 people. We went down about 95%, all the way down to about 400, 500 people. So in a village like this, where there would be anywhere from like 70 people all the way up to 1,000 people, this village went down, I think, to like 20 people. Okay. And so in order to, you know, fish and hunt and sustain everything that we have going on here, you need a lot of people. Right. What are these? It's a mortuary pole. The mortuary poles are what uh, house the remains of either chiefs or someone held in high esteem. So they were put in a bedwood box and put up into the mortuary poles. What was the importance of resting in a tree? Be closer to the creator. So here are some frontal poles. Yep. You can kind of see like they fell like this. Yeah. And so that's the back of them there. Okay. Front poles are what would show what family you belong in. So I'm an eagle, and so I my crests are eagle, frog, sculpin, and beaver. And right. so those are the, the symbols that I'm allowed to wear, or yeah. I have rights to wear. Yeah. What's the purpose of uh, just leaving it? Did just That's their intention. Just it's, to keep them there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We bring it. We, um, we take the tree from the earth, and yeah. then we create what we need to. And then it just goes right back into the earth. Right. Yeah, and how the nurse logs, yeah. they harbor life. And so that's exactly what we kind of want oh, great. as well. Yeah. If Raven and Alana hadn't been here to show me around, I would have never guessed there was once a thriving village here. But that's how Custa was built. Once it was no longer needed, it would go back to the earth from where it came. At some point in the future, there'll be no trace of this village at all. And maybe that's how it should be. After we checked out the ancient village of Custa, we're now heading to Tulumslum on the other side of the island. My guide, Raven Pochka, runs an amazing program here. She brings Haida youth from all over to help them rediscover some of the lost traditions of their ancestors. West Coast. West Coast. <laughs> from food and medicine to language and songs, they get a chance to learn more about their heritage and reconnect with nature. It's like my home away from home. And it kind of teaches you, like, not to lose your touch with Mother Nature. It's like, you feel like you don't need anything when you're out here, like, it's pretty sweet out here. Now that we're at camp, I wanted to ask the two students, Jack and Gouda Haggins, how they felt about the impact of industry on traditional lands. So we've been sort of climbing up the coast and going to these places like industrial leftovers, you know, mm -hmm. from like mining and logging and what do you guys think about those things being left in the wilderness and things like that, just sort of rotting? And <laughs> it's disappointing to think that there's somebody who's ignorant yeah. enough to think that it's OK to do that to somebody else's home. Yeah. I've been to an old mine down in Swan Bay. They left, like, everything. They left buildings there just rotting away into the ground. They did not clean up their mess. Unfortunately, you're no longer allowed on the island because it's so bad All there. the chemicals that they're using to break it, break mm -hmm. it open and all that. It's just everywhere. Yeah. 
what do you think they should do with things like that? I feel like, I don't know, like they should at least clean up like what they bring in, I guess, like, I don't know, like. Pack it in, pack it out yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> Many of the lessons that our ancestors taught us was when you go somewhere, if you're gonna stay there for a while, whether it's like a few days or like a month after you go, you leave no trace of yourself at all whatsoever. So it's almost like you were never there in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that should be taught and that's something that sh should it be, you know, right. referred to. Among all cultures. Mm -hmm. Dude! <laughs> right here. Look at these guys. You guys like football? <laughs> Not ballers. So these are the stinging nettles. So if we're going to use it for um, putting on someone's body, we can take a long, couple longer stalks. You finding some nettles? Yeah. Do you have anywhere that's hurting on you? Oh, you're going to hit me with it? Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go with the back of the knee. OK. You've never done it before? No, this is going to be my first time. All right, we're going to do it together. But she was saying that her nani, your nani was trying to get her you to do it to her? Yeah, but I couldn't do it because she's my nani, and I don't want to hurt her. Yeah, you can hurt me. All right, I'm just going to bite on this. Oh! Oh! I don't hurt. <laughs> Yeah, right there. Yeah. Okay, that's probably good. Oh, it does sting. Yeah. <laughs> it like gets worse. Yeah, and it's gonna get worse for a while. <laughs> really? Yeah. I could have been told that. Oh. <laughs> How's it feel? It's getting better. How's it feel for you? It's kind of funny. Just kidding. <laughs> It turns out that the stinging nettles are not only a home security system and a natural pain reliever, but they are also a great source of fiber. So we're going to steam these nettles. We're going to fry them in butter, because that just sounds so much more yummy. Oh, so it's going to be French Haida collision. Yeah. All right. And we have a ton of butter, so you can just go crazy with it. Oh, OK. I ain't scared of more butter. Mm. Yeah? Mm-hmm. No stinging. Good taste. Yeah. All right, I want to start with a toast. Yay! Here's to our new Haida yeah. friends. Yay! Thank you for having Woo! us. Yeah. Appreciate it. How? Thanks for coming, you guys. Yeah. Thank you. It's been good. Masset is one of three towns on Haida Gwaii. There's almost a thousand residents that live, work, and play here. Raven wanted to show me some more active signs of life in her hometown. So this is Rick. Hi, everybody. Hi. So you guys are going to kick my ass? Yeah. OK, yes. good. It's roller derby time. We're running. Let's do it. Jog, two up. High knees, high knees. Hit him. I'm out of breath already. I'm warming up for roller derby. I'm tired. I'm out of shape. That was a hard warm up. All right, I'm going. Feels, it feels natural. It's not a race. It's just a warm up. Can you make it uh, slammed around a little bit? Oh. OK, all right. You guys want to get hit? Oh, I'm sorry that I hit you. I think I'm doing pretty good for a first timer. I farted over there. Don't go over there. It's really social. Oh, bam! Bam! Give me the whip! Oh, that was so rad. It's doing pretty good. No more skateboarding. Eight wheels only from now on. Nice one. 
Exhausted and almost out of time in this beautiful land of Haida Gwaii, I wanted to get Raven's thoughts on the balance between industry and the preservation of nature. For the people that have lived here for thousands of years, uh, I think it's difficult to witness that the industry is not necessarily, I don't feel like there's a balance between what's being taken and what's being given back. Like there okay. isn't a, like a sustainable system that is okay. in place. It's a bit of a double-edged sword, you know, for a lot of indigenous people where industry is shaping up all around them, like people in the tar sands, where it's coming right through their backyard, mm -hmm. you know, and for us here, it's the fishing industry and the logging industry. And we're kind of stuck in this space right now where in order for people to live here, there needs to be work. As humans, we're so intelligent that we could come up with other ways of making money and, mm -hmm. and creating an economy that we don't have to destroy our environment. My hope and dream for Haida Gwaii, I'd love to see more people out on boats and living closely to the land and, mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe starting to live out in our traditional longhouses, mm -hmm. out actually in our villages, like seeing people live year-round out at Kusta is because I believe so much in every decision you make is kind of a ripple that goes out into the rest yeah. of the world and you can send out a really awesome ripple, you know, or you can contribute to some of the issues and some of the problems and, and you know, there's, there's choice in that every right. day, so, yeah. yeah. Raven is definitely sending out those good ripples, working with the next generation of Haida youth, trying to turn those ripples into waves, striving to protect their lands from any future harm in the name of profit. Not that anyone is saying all industry is evil, but if you're going to come out here and make a bunch of cash working the land and sea, the least you can do is clean up after yourself. Beautiful is the mountain Beautiful is the river Beautiful is the land Beautiful is the sky It's so beautiful So beautiful It's so beautiful so beautiful Beautiful are the children Beautiful are the old Beautiful is where many legends have been told It's so beautiful So beautiful 